Hello, everyone. I'm here with Dr. Peter Smith, who is the author of Free Range Learning in the Digital Age, um, as well as a former congressman, former higher ed administrator, um, founding president of the Community College of Vermont, um, and looking forward to talking about how this um, book can be useful for um, educators as well as students and policymakers and pretty much anyone who's interested in learning and helping adults have access to higher education. Um, so Dr. Smith, would you uh, like to tell, tell the audience a little bit more or tell, tell me a little bit more about yourself and your background and what, got, what uh, interested you in um, writing well, free range learning? What happened, it is the fourth book I've done mm -hmm. And what happened uh, to me was, and uh, I come from a very fortunate background, and during high school I was able to go to something called Outward Bound, which was a month in the woods uh, learning survival training. And I had a profound experience there. I was from Vermont. I knew about the woods. I thought, oh, this is going to be a breeze. But what I learned was that you know, you need to be on a team with people, and the guy who can light the fire in the rain is just as important as the person who can hike all day. And, and you have the slow walkers and the fast, or the long walkers, but what you need is to know that someone has to be able to read a map, and everybody's got something to contribute. And we had to keep a journal every night. And that experience got me going on a path of what I call experiential learning. I wanted to pay attention to the learning that people do in their lives, whether it's in a union hall or a, a corporate setting or personally on their own or whatever. And that was when I got going, it was the late 60s. So this is a long time ago. And that got me into the Community College of Vermont. And I, and I was the founder of that college when I was 24. It's a very unlikely story, and uh, the only reason really I think I got the job was because no one else wanted it, <laughs> and uh, because nobody thought it would work. And it was going to be adult, community-based learning in rural Vermont because there are not enough people in Vermont to have a campus. And so we were going to do it differently, and we are going to use experience. So we started with Head Start Mothers. And they were having a personal experience of raising children, but they were also reading books and going to training. And it would just rolled out from there. And I've been involved in what would be called the assessment of experiential learning ever since then. And that led uh, to this book. Uh, it's been a circuitous, uh, as most life paths are. I mean, and uh, I was in politics for a while, but. When I left politics, which is what you say when you get beat, um, <laughs> I went back into higher ed, and I really think that's where I was meant to be. And this book is the outgrowth of my third book, which was called Harnessing America's Wasted Talent, A New Ecology of Learning. And that was in, 19, in 2010. But it was so early in this revolution that we're experiencing now um, it was so early that it was a more of a prospective book. And then, so three years ago, I said, I want to bring that up to date. But the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to talk to people. And so that's, that's the, the, short, the short version of how I got where I am. I believe, as I say in the book, the average adult spends more than 700 hours a year learning things purposefully. And that learning affects them. And we in college need to learn how to recognize it, value it, and put it to work. And that respect of the individual, the ending of knowledge discrimination. You know, I say we value learning today based on where you learned it, not how well you know it and what you can do with it. I want us to go to that respecting all learning. And that's the um, sort of the tenor of the book and the stories of the learners who got left out the first time around or are, got a degree but now need something else and they can't because they're trapped. And I wanted those stories to go out to people so they would know they're not alone and that they can be, that there are opportunities. So there are some of the opportunities are laid out in the book as well. And uh, you mentioned knowledge discrimination. That's uh, one of the key terms that you use in yeah. your book, as yeah. well as hidden credentials, um, which I think are kind of related. Would you talk a little bit more about those? Sure. 
Hidden Credentials was actually the title of my first book. <clears throat> and the whole notion was that we were seeing people walking around with talent and ability, um, but they weren't, and so they, they, they knew how to do things, uh, how to apply things, but they couldn't get the chance to do it because they didn't have a formal credential. So as I've gone through the years, knowledge discrimination was the word that uh, came to me or the phrase when I was doing these interviews because as I'm listening to people, and there's one fella in the, in the book who says, um, I think he actually emailed me, and he had, this guy, three different times, he had done his supervisor's job when the supervisor left, and he did it very well, and his employer said, yeah, you did it fine, but you're never gonna get the job until you get a baccalaureate degree, and he couldn't get it because he had to work and he had a family, and he said, you know, I'll leave the profanity out, but he said, you know, I drive by that college every day, going to work and coming home from work. That's no shining city of opportunity on the hill. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's a, a castle of exclusivity with the drawbridge drawn up. He was furious, he was mm -hmm. bitter. And that is knowledge discrimination, because he knew how to do something, but he couldn't get his ticket stamped. And, uh, and so that's where the phrase came from. And there is, um, around that section of the book, you talk about um, the remoteness, the, the, the facets of higher education that are remote to adult learners, yes. can be a remote to adult learners. How can higher education fix that? Um, that you would seem, you would think that that would be um, something that they would be interested in, considering that the market for adult learners, people who have some college and no degree, is 10 times as large as the market for people who are coming straight out of high school going You into would school. think that, wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> the thing of the matter is, and this is a very important point, um, I think many, many institutions are either going to learn how to respond to this mm -hmm change, I mean, it's a technologically enhanced change. I mean, it wasn't possible at, to do it with thousands of people or tens of thousands of people even 15 or 20 years ago. Um, <clears throat> but in there are places like Sailor who are offering the resource for learning um, and people are coming and using it every day, thousands of people, I'm sure, um, that, that wouldn't have been doable 25 years ago. And so higher education in many regards uh, better watch out because the only thing they can't do is stand still. Um, now, the whole notion of disruptive change, you know, we talk about disruption these days, and the fact that what's hard about colleges changing <clears throat> is that their academic structure is an economic structure as well, and the campus is an economic reality. And the faculty, by history, run the curriculum, and it all happens on the campus. Well, now we can have a college degree in the University of Maryland University College. We have 90,000 students on four continents. And, uh, and it's uh, online and blended, and they're place-based as well as online. But the fact is the curriculum is consistent and it's high quality. Um, and so you, you don't have to do it the old way. And I think the thing that's interesting is that higher education historically has been able to control the change that comes to it um, by language. And because if you think of colleges even 20 years ago as an oasis of information in, a de in an information poor desert, the community around it, you, you had the libraries, but that was about it. And you had to go to a college or continuing ed to get something. Right. Um, now that desert has gone green. There's information everywhere and learning anytime, anywhere, anything, with some limitations, but not many, is possible. And so you have new nonprofits and new businesses like Degreed and Portfolium, which I write about in the book. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as well as college, what I call adult-friendly colleges, the four or five presidents that I talked to and are in the book. So there, but the fact is there's, there's about 
10 different ways now, to, and I think there'll be many more, to skin the, the if you will, skin the learning cat. <laughs> uh, that's not a very nice metaphor, actually, <laughs> I don't think. But th there's, there's m many ways to do it. And so <clears throat> what's disruptive is, a, a if you think of a college as having its alumni and its faculty, they're happy with the way things are. That's what they know how to do. But along comes a UMUC or Sailor or co other combinations of who can do something just as good or better in terms of content and quality uh, for a fraction of the price. And, uh, or in your case for the content, you know, there's no price at all. Yes. And that's a great place to start. So if you were a higher ed um, administrator now mm -hmm. um, and you were trying to change a traditional campus and make it more adult friendly, what would you do or what changes would you advocate for? Or what uh, advice and I write you? about this in the book and I use the, what was really interesting is we talked to five or six college presidents mm -hmm. independently. They all said different versions of the same thing. And, uh, and, and which was really amazing. And they're all doing business quite differently. But first of all, I would look for data analytics to help me understand every week how engaged students are the learners are in the curriculum. So, and that is possible today. Um, and some colleges are doing it. And I write about some of the, the, the nonprofits and for profits that are helping do those data analytics. But high support, you need to have high support. And that is more than me just holding your hand, that is giving you good information about jobs, good information about the value of the curriculum. So you understand if you do these things, it'll lead to that future. And then keeping you on that path and not asking you to do things that are extraneous or not pertinent to where you want to go. So there's is good information, high support, um, and then content that, and evaluations that are adult friendly and respectful of the learning you bring with them. And I would assess the learning you bring with you. It's something we do at UMUC and, and, uh, and other and I write about Kale in the book, C-A-E-L. I helped found it 50 years ago. But that's a national association committed to assessing your prior learning. Uh, and then there are models. And I would say there's the online model or what's called blended. So I could go to school every other Saturday all day long. And then during the next two weeks, I would have material that was available to me online that I would do. And it's like listening to the material, taking notes, doing whatever I'm at. And then I go back every other Saturday, all day, or two nights a week, or you can do it, but it's called low residency. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's gonna be more and more popular and it's cheaper and it's a different use of the property, if you have the campus. Or I think you're gonna see learning in union halls, and I think you're gonna see learning in the workplace. Um, and I know there's learning going on in some public libraries where you can actually run a, run a class or run a college program uh, in, a, in, a, in the back room of a library with computers where people don't have to leave their community to go to school. So I think what's gonna be under pressure is the notion of a full-time student uh, going to school 20 hours a week, living on a campus or commuting, who's the 18, 19, 20, 21. Already 75% of the learners in America who are involved in higher education are over the age of 24. So that's changing and that means the campuses have to change because if I'm 30 years old, I've got a life and a family maybe and a job and kids and other things going on, so I can't, you know, parking matters, yeah. child, <laughs> child care might matter. Absolutely. Distance to the campus might matter, time of day matters. So now we can do something about all those things. And let's talk a little bit about the students. So um, in your book, you feature a lot of, a lot of student interviews. What are the common, what's the common arc that you see in each of these students' journeys? Are there, are there certain paths that the mm -hmm. students end up taking? There, <clears throat> the first thing that happens is for whatever reason, and it ranges from my parents never went to college, so it never occurred to me to go to college, to I tried to go to college and, and flunked out. One guy 
left four times. Or there's all sorts of reasons why people miss the boat the first time around, mm -hmm. okay? Then what happens is they're, they're going along, working, um, usually in this case, uh, uh, there are, I'm sure some who don't or aren't able to, but, and then they come to what I call a turning point, and I write about turning points, and it's, it's an aha moment when you say, I don't want to continue like this. And so the woman who heard uh, two people talking about her at work, and she had applied for another a, a job up, up the ladder, mm -hmm. and they were saying she's not going to get the job because she doesn't have a baccalaureate degree. And she just said, that was it. Yeah. I was my own worst enemy. I had been, my kids were in college. I loved to read when I was a kid. I went into the military. I came out. I, I, I didn't spend my, my benefit, education benefit money well. Nobody really helped me think that through. And so I just never did it. And now my daughter, my younger daughter is about to finish college and I just said, I'm doing it. And that was for her the turning point. And what happens after that, and I write about this as well, is a transition in which you, you say, I'm going, uh, and you experience the notion of a change in your, in your assumptions about yourself, um, about your view of the life path you're on, and you move to a new place for you, a more powerful place, a more assertive place, in terms of wanting to get and working to get things that you need in order to live a better, and I'm not talking just about working life, but your social life, your community life, your civic life. We know that people with the more education you have, the more involved you are in politics, in your community, in issues, and you vote more, you're healthier, you live longer. There's pretty good reasons to change your path. So, so there's this, Missing the, missing the opportunity the first time around, then there are these turning points that happen, then there's doing something with them. And if my term is if you have come to a turning point and don't do something about it, you become a prisoner of your own experience. In other words, you, you're really caught. Mm -hmm. And it's never too late, but you've got to be able to go through the transition and get the resources and then proceed. And so that is really the, the steps that I walk people through with the stories, the stories that I got from real people. And so I've noticed in the stories that there's also something transformative that seems to happen with the students who are doing the prior learning assessment oh, absolutely. Uh, process itself. Um, each student seemed to talk about some intangible that they, they didn't realize they had, whether it was... Um, assertiveness, uh, kind of a new sense of self uh, accomplishment or self confidence. Is there a way that that process or something like it could be used for traditional age? Oh, absolutely. Well, well, I think it. I think it's if you're under twenty five, mm -hmm. you've had less experience unless you went into the army or the Peace Corps or something like that. Um, I think you can use reflective assessments. Mm -hmm much earlier, but the thing, that, the thing that is great about the assessment of prior experiential learning, mm -hmm. it's like there's the fella who got credit for, a, I'm going to call it a Computer 101 class, and he went into Computer 202, and that wasn't the title of the course, and he said, I knew everything that the people who took Computer 101 knew, except I had learned it at work, so I know how to employ it. So it wasn't just knowing about it, I had actually used it. And that was much more powerful than fellows, who had, men and boys and girls in this case, who had done it, but they hadn't ever done anything with it. And so the, what, what happens, and the other thing he said, and you saw it again and again in the book, I had no idea how much I actually knew. And what happens is we know people learn 700 hours or more a year. That's the average. But the other thing is that they take in this learning and they essentially forget that they did it. So it's just in there, influencing them, and they're using it, but nobody ever put a pin on it and said, oh, by the way, 
You just learned a lot about Brazil and speaking Spanish because you decided you wanted to go to Brazil, or in Brazil's case, it probably be Portuguese. But anyway, um, and so what happens when you go through this assessment process, um, it's a class, and you build a portfolio, and you have, there's a rigorous way of going back and inspecting all the jobs you've held, all the things you've done that are important to you, remembering them and then getting inside them and, and really pulling out the pieces. And it blows people's minds. And they say, oh my God. And I, I had this first experience when I was at the Community College of Vermont. We had our first graduation in 1973, maybe. Maybe it was 72. And this woman, we had eight graduates, okay? Oh, big day. And this woman came up to me, one of the graduates, and she said, thank you for the degree, and thank you for the college, and all of that. But she said, what I really want to thank you for is putting together my experiential learning. She ran a, a child care center. Mm -hmm. And she said, I really want to thank you for the assessment of my prior learning, the portfolio course, we'd call it today. I said, why? And she said, because now I know I'm a learner and I'll, all, I've always been a learner and I'll never stop learning. And I thought, oh my God. You know, I was thinking of it as a fair thing to do and an academically appropriate thing to do, but I hadn't thought about it as a transformational experience in a person's life. And that is what you hear in the book and the stories again and again is I'm, I'm in charge of my own life now. I know, and, and people become very conscious about the learning they're doing every day. Um, it's, it's, it was one of the most powerful parts of this. I've always known that, but you know, it's one thing to know it up here, it's another thing to know it down here. And uh, I really, it, my, my appreciation for the power of this uh, stuff and assessment of your experience for learning value uh, really deepened with the writing of this book. So um, say you were giving advice to somebody who wants to start this process, what would be the kind of, what would be the four or five steps that you would have that, or however many, how would you break it down into bullet points? Uh, what should someone do? Well, of course, if they were, mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing I'd do is say, check out the University of Maryland University College, because <laughs> we, we do this, but you know, not everybody wants to go to the same place. Right. And so, it, depending on where they lived, I would say, probably the thing I would do would be most helpful is say, go to Kale, it's C-A-E-L, go to their website, kale.org, and look at the colleges in your state, and I talk about this in the book, so it's all how to do it, mm -hmm. in your state that are members of Kale. Kale is the Council for the Assessment of Experiential Learning, okay? So if somebody's a member, college is a member of that group and they're in your, your state or in a, the region of your state within 30 miles of where you live, that may be a place to just find out what they do. Now, maybe they don't do what you need, maybe, you know, because everybody has a different approach and some people, frankly, say they do it and then really not so much, you know, kind of. <laughs> and so you need to sort those things out for yourself. But some people, I think uh, a lot of people are going to be very interested in either a topic and they want to find a college that is best at that topic and maybe online. Mm -hmm. Or another might be interested in a college that's local within 25 miles of where they live with a distance learning or... Um, or uh, uh, <clears throat> remote learning where you, you know, come to campus once every two weeks, or, I mean, and they do these assessments. So people need to sort through what is most, like, if somebody wanted to do this and it was in cybersecurity, I know we're, at you know, see, really, really strong, award-winning in cybersecurity. If that's more important than going to a college 10 miles down the road because you live in Georgia, then you might want to come to a place like us. But uh, I write about it in the book because th th there is now increasingly, there are ways to really find out where the best fit for you with a college or a learning program of some kind, how to get that best fit. And, um, 
And that's as opposed to just saying, well, I, here I am, so I'm going to go there because it's five miles from my house. Maybe that's good. Maybe it's not. And you want to be a discriminating thinker about, like that when you're putting your life on the line, if you will, to, to change it. Absolutely. And so I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit. Um, so if I were a faculty member or someone in charge of reviewing whether or not credit should be assessed mm -hmm. for or should be granted for something, I would probably argue that personal learning experiences are very nuanced. It's very difficult to, how can you standardize it? Everyone understands something differently. Everyone's definition of mastery is different. How, how would you counter the, and how do you really attach academic rigor to, you know, of course people are learning. You have to continue to learn and evolve to survive. How do you really attach academic rigor to that? What would your response to that the be? The response would be, good question, and you're right. Uh, it's hard. I mean, it's, but the fact is every course you have in your college uh, has um, a curriculum, and it has an, a set of assumptions about what somebody needs to know at the end of the course. And uh, historically, we, we would line those, uh, the personal learning that you're putting together in the, in the portfolio in the class, mm -hmm. you're putting it against courses. So you're saying this equals that. And the, there's a faculty member teaching the course that's helping you do that. That faculty member does not review your portfolio. You have a separate content expert or multiple content experts, depending on how many courses you're claiming, looking at your assertions. It would not surprise you that m most learners who go through this, well, one, it was really cool, most learners who go through this um, graduate, finish their programs at like 60% higher rate than people, adults who don't go through it. So it, it really helps. Um, <clears throat> but also most people who finish a portfolio and get it assessed, they claim more credit than they get. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it, it, I think it's usually, the awarding of credit is sometimes between 60 and 70% of what the, all the claims were. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens now with computer uh, technologically enhanced and, and algorithms, we can begin to do these comparisons um, with a high rate of validity um, using, using technology to get you 80% of the way there and then having a subject matter expert do, do the final okay. And that's a very complicated topic, but we're going to be able to, what matters is, in my mind, we have accounting one and accounting two and accounting three and accounting four. If you say you can do one and two and we agree, the question is, can you succeed in accounting three? If you can't, we need to go back and look at the process. The way it happens now is if you don't have accounting one or two, we just assume you need accounting one. Right. And you're bored to death and may quit. Two-thirds of the adults that leave higher education without their completion do so for non-academic reasons. Two-thirds. And, and it's like, wait a minute, I know this. This is so freaking boring and I'm paying for it and I'm wasting my time and to heck with it. So I turn the proof around. If we can legitimize your claim, let's give you the shot at at uh, accounting three. If you can't do it, we can always move you back to accounting two. We don't have to charge you more. We'll just move you back to accounting two and, and say no. So the point is you've got to perform according to the award of the credit once you go to school. And what I think colleges have to learn how to do is not, not take your money and then charge you again or make you finish the course. With good data analytics, I would know at the end of the third week whether you're participating actively and sub substantially with the, the material or whether you're you know, over your head and move you right back to accounting too. Boom. And so this, 
this also has, um, not only does it have implications for higher education, but this has implications for employers, people who are looking at workforce development, <laughs> that kind of, um, you know, there's always a lot of talk going around about the skills gap. And you are, in the book, you argue a little bit that the skills gap and the credential gap, and I would say the communications gap mm -hmm. or a candidate's ability to communicate that they have the skills that are needed yep. in a way that an employer would accept are all related. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, that's the, the new frontier that's getting uh, worked on right now. Um, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to be part of that. And it's really what I talk about in the third section of the book, which is, a, I say, a GPS for learning and work. And, and essentially, if you think about... Um, I've got a portfolio and it's all my formal learning and my informal learning and it's all been validated by a third party or a college. Here's all this information. And then I've got academic standards over here and I've got employment standards over here. I can take this and we know it can be done and apply it to the academic standards. I can take the same information and apply it to the employment standards. They're different standards for different purposes. But when you create those translations, you're then hooking academic level to employment uh, readiness. And, and so that's where I think a lot of the AI and data analytics are gonna become incredibly helpful. And I think we'll see uh, models um, like that operating at least um, as, as model demonstrations within 18 to 24 months. Wow. And so you're absolutely right. And I think you'll see employers, um, like I was talking to someone the other day and she, she said, we have warehouses in 20 states. And we've got men and women driving forklifts. And I know in those people, there are future managers of the warehouse. I don't know how to find them. Mm -hmm. What are we gonna, can you help us look at those people and put together a cohort of learners and, and then find out whether they're ready to learn about management and be ready to get promoted when the time comes. Uh, so I think, and, and I talk about some of the innovators, you know, portfolio, degree, credly, those, they're, they're do, what, what Degreed does, for instance, is you say what you want to learn and they just start throwing learning resources at you. And then when they keep what you, you've done and read and then they connect to employers and say, hey, Peter Smith's ready to do this. And they've got several hundred employers that are considering that. So it's all going to get better and better. And in the beginning, these things can be raggedy because it's never been done before. I mean, Columbus sailed in a 93-foot, three-masted galleon, and now you can fly to Paris on a 787. You know, things get better. Yeah. Things change. <laughs> but you got to start somewhere. And I think, I think there's going to, the world, the whole HR world, and what it means to be successful in school and be successful at work is going to be redefined and how to do those and be those kinds of successes is gonna be reinvented in the next, and I think the start, I think it's already started, but whether it's a three-year horizon or a five-year horizon, you're gonna see amazing, just take Sailor, there are gonna be amazing uses that Sailor's courses are put to, and things that people who dreamed this place up may never have even thought about. And that's cool. I think I agree. Um, so if you were, um, well, that was, I will, I'll come back to that question. Um, for employers, what are some th things that they could implement that would be able to, that would allow them to be able to accommodate free range learners now and be able to um, hire them efficiently in the future without using um, a bachelor's degree as a screening tool? Um, I don't think the tools really exist yet, mm -hmm. uh, but I think we were just talking about uh, the kinds of translation 
um, uh, algorithms that will make that possible. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that, that employers right now need to do, frankly, is be much more assertive with colleges or other sources of training about telling them what it is they want, not just taking stuff off the shelf. And when I say what it is they want, that means they have to look at their jobs and they have to look at their jobs three ways. And jobs are, there's vertical and there's a horizontal in any, every job. So depending on where you are. So I'll take, say you're a GS, we're in DC right now, mm -hmm. so we'll, take, we'll use general services. So you're a GS8. A GS8, all the way across the government, is, is assumed to know and be able to do a certain level of performance. Mm -hmm. That's what makes them an eight. But in their agency or in their unit, they have a vertical set of skills and they are not a nine or a 10 or 11 or 12, they're an eight. So they know. So say they're in the EPA or wherever, the National Science Foundation, wherever they are, there's a horizontal thing, they, a standard they have met mm -hmm. that is peculiar to being an eight and then there's a vertical standard they have met that is peculiar to their, their unit. And if you can take those two things and understand those two things mm -hmm. in three ways. One is what are the skills? Okay, that's like a screwdriver screw or writing a code or that's a skill. Mm -hmm. Then what are the cross-cutting intellectual abilities like problem solving and critical thinking, numbers, math, writing um, that you need? What level of that sophistication do you need to do this job well? Mm -hmm. And then finally, there's the issue of values and teamwork and your behavior. In other words, that's, and what are the behaviors you're looking for that are desirable to teamwork, leadership, diversity, whatever it may be. And so you've got to, I think what we're going to see is people coming at uh, all three of those things. Right now, we do the skills and we don't do, you know, it's like I remember that the Civil War was in the 1860s. Well, no, what did it mean to the country? How, how can I describe that? How do I write about it? Think critically, what, were, what, what, what did it mean? And then what were the behaviors that people were exhibiting that got us into it, got us through it, got us out of it? Mm -hmm. See, it isn't about liberal, I, I was fond of saying, it isn't occupational or professional versus the liberal arts. It's both because you need this problem solving, critical thinking, writing, numeration, the ability to uh, work on a team. These, these are things that we associate with liberal arts education. Um, there are other ways to learn them, but they need to be learned. And so it isn't a choice. You've got to, you've got to do both. You've got to do all three things. So that's, that's, and that's where we're going, but it's going to require employers and HR people to get much more granular about what, who it is they're looking for, what are the skills and abilities and behaviors, and live with that, which makes a lot of them pretty antsy, frankly, today, and then asking colleges to do this. This is what we need. We don't need what you have on the shelf. We need this, and getting colleges to do it. So if you were a policymaker now, what, or what advice would you give to people who are policymakers now who are looking at the, the issue of how do we get people out of um, industries like trucking that may be automated out within the next three or four years when, you know, they're fairly lucrative for, yeah. you know, getting a credential that didn't necessarily require an associate's degree or, or a bachelor's degree. What, what advice would you give to policymakers well, now? One of the things, I, we, we're right at the beginning, but I think we've got to change the way we spend money. Now, institutions need financial support. Now, I believe that public higher education and, non, and, and, and private higher education, but public, I'll stick with that for now, um, is part of the checks and balances of a civil society. In other words, we always think about that as the government and the constitution and all that, yes. But more broadly, in the society, there is uh, a check and a balance around 
people's lives, social, civic, and economic lives, and the overall good of the society. And I think that's what's at stake here. I think we're going to see uh, a movement. I read a, uh, an idea today that some of the federal funding, I think it was Title IV, the idea was it might um, be put into personal learning accounts. Uh, there may be ways to alter tax policy so that when you spend money on yourself and in, in specifically pre-approved programs or pathways, you get a tax break. Um, but I think, uh, so I think if I were a policy maker, that's one thing. The other thing with accreditation and federal regulation, I would promote what I call innovation contracts. And that's my term, there's nothing special about it. But what I mean by that is, if a college sees a way they want to change the way they do business, maybe they want to affiliate with a boot camp, maybe they want to um, uh, you know, do something else, but they, it, it will be in violation or it will rub up against a federal regulation or their accreditation. So this would be a way for them to approach the accreditor and say, this is what we want to do. And the accreditor is, has five criteria, and you have to meet these criteria, and then we'll give you five years to try it. And if it works, by the end of the third year, you're going to build it out. And at the end of the third year, if it isn't working, you're going to put it to bed. But giving people the ability to experiment without losing their accreditation. And if the accreditor says it's okay, then the federal government says it's okay. That would be my the way I'd do it. So I think there are there are things we can do that loosen up the reins of uh, authority on what is quality higher ed and what is not to let people experiment because some of them are going to succeed and some of them are going to fail. But if we if we can't ex we can't experiment and try new things. Um, we're not going to get out of the box. So I would think, you know, they, then, and I guess the last thing I'd say is innovation contracts. Or, uh, that's my term for it. Would, I think, and changing the way the money flows a little bit, I think those things are going to happen. Okay. Well, thank you for that. What about um, for entities like Sailor Academy? Um, and as you already know, Sailor um, not only provides free courses for um, anyone, anywhere to learn, but we partner with colleges, particularly a lot of the adult-friendly colleges mm -hmm. that you mentioned in your book, um, to provide credit pathways and low co lower cost pathways toward right. a degree. What advice would you give um, Sailor Academy and entities like ours who are um, working to lower the to partner with higher education, lower the cost um, to education, and um, create opportunities um, and access to education worldwide. Uh, I think uh, I'm not as, as comfortable talking about that mm -hmm. just because it's not where I have lived my life. But mm -hmm. I think it's the same as what I would say to a college, uh, <clears throat> and that is in the world we're going into, uh, nobody's gonna be good at everything. So you need to decide at Sailor what it is you want to be world class at. And then you look for partners, wherever they may be, academic partners, employment partners, um, uh, data analytics partners, I mean, to, to maximize the value of what you do very, very well. And don't make the mistake of thinking you can be all things to all people, or you can control all of the drivers of quality because nobody's going to be able to afford to control all the drivers of quality. So you got to you got to sort of see where do we want to be in five years, and then you sort of reverse engineer back to today and say where are we now, and and so then that will tell you do we deepen our partnerships with higher education? Do we find someone who wants to do this job conversion translation to the workplace? Um, like Burning Glass or MC are two companies that are really, really doing great stuff with job information. Um, or do we uh, want to create a personal pathing um, application so that if somebody comes to Sailor, they not only get content, but they get a chance to try out different 
career paths and educational paths in a game-like atmosphere without having to risk their skin. So, you know, they're, they're, but the main thing is to decide the one or two things you want to be good at, decide longer term who you, what is the impact you want to be part of, and then find the partners because it's all going to be partners. Awesome. Any um, other parting thoughts about uh, either the book or um, uh, what you've learned from kind of the, the journey that you've taken uh, that you'd like to share? Yes. I mm -hmm. think, um, I didn't know you were going to ask me that question, but there are two or three things that come to my mind, and I'll try to be uncharacteristically brief. Um, one is that <clears throat> I think of people getting the learning they need and having it valued is a social justice issue of the first rank because we have been a very good in our society at telling people if they didn't go to college, it's their fault. And even more implying that they're stupid. It's just not the case. We have talent and capacity walking around this country that is unrecognized and potential that is unrecognized. Um, and we need to tap it. And we need to do that for their good and for the society's good. Because everybody, when you make more money, you spend a little more money. And, and that's good for you and good for the people who you're giving to the services or the food or the haircut or whatever it is you want. Mm -hmm. So I think there really is a, a, a compelling um, social issue as well as a fairness and respect issue. This is about respecting, if I am an indigenous, uh, come from an indigenous background, I have history, I have culture, it should be respected. We should find ways to count uh, my life experience, uh, anybody's life experience in a legitimate way, but there's respect. And all the things we're talking about, I'm respecting the life. We are respecting the lives of people who come to us. So I think that's um, really, really um, important. And I think, you know, the last thing I'd say is that if, if we can make, that this is, a, I'll put it in, what I learned personally, I'm pretty much what I look like, okay? I was born, uh, uh, unfortunately, not to a lot of money, but to a lot of privilege. And I have redefined privilege having done this work my privilege is that I've never lost a fight that I didn't choose. And I've chosen some and I've lost some. Um, but I chose them. Um, these folks were losing fights before the turning point. They're losing fights every day they never asked for. And that's what this is about, is saying, we've got to get straight with these folks it's not a personal blame, it is a condition of life and we have an obligation to do something about it with them. And that to me is what has motivated me for 50 years. But I really got it much deeper doing this, these interviews, much deeper. You see kind of a common thread of people realizing or having heard or having told themselves that they're not necessarily college material, which I, I exactly. hate that term. Exactly. Um, but then kind of taking almost a harder path because they're not being pushed through a path or facilitated through a path. They're having to initiate it on their it's, own it's, and coming out of the process even more um, even more empowered um, yes. and, and able to self-actualize. And they, <clears throat> exactly. And it is, it is harder uh, because you... And that's where the high support, it, doing this is hard enough all by itself. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is make the adult friendly college, the, the experience itself. Think of this, when you go to Nordstrom's or shop on Amazon, um, they, give, they give you a concierge. It's a friendly user experience. They want you in there. And at colleges, we've made it historically Hard. And the term we use for graduation is persistence. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, the whole image is that it's like going uphill in the winter, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> in, a, in an ice storm. Well, no. We want the learning itself is hard enough. Mm -hmm. So let's make it 
as user friendly as we can so that you can get to the learning and stay with the learning and complete the learning. To me, that's, that's the key. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Thank really you. appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Sailor. Um, yes, absolutely. Well, please do, um, if you are an adult student, know an adult student, or think you uh, might be interested in any facet of um, learning, please do check out Free Range Learning. Um, we'll include a link as well. Um, and Dr. Smith, thank you so much again oh, for your time. Oh, my pleasure. What fun. <laughs> absolutely.